Hello everyone, I think we're actually live, Katya. I think we are. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our first Hangout. Welcome. Do we have to introduce ourselves, do you think? Yes, go on. Let's introduce ourselves. Although people should know us from the, um, the little, little bios at the beginning. But um, Giovanna Facetta and I work here at uh, the School of Education of the University of Glasgow. And you speak And I speak many Italian. Languages. Parlo Italiano. Hablo Espanol. Muy mal. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Milano. Of That's your dirty secret. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my, my mother tongue is actually Friulano, and um, that is uh, a language which is spoken in the northeast of Italy, and it's the language I speak when I go home, and it's the language I forget that I speak because it's not an important language. But you and that's really poetry. bad for a linguist, yes. Oh, it's not good stuff. And you recited poetry in it yesterday. I recited so. poetry in it yesterday, yes. And yes. Um, mein Name ist Kathi Fromberger und ich arbeite um, hier an der Universität in Glasgow uh, in Schottland. Also, so my name is Katja and I, I work here at the School of Education like Giovanna. Um, and my languages are German um, and uh, je parle français très mal. Um, Mais, mais je peux pratiquer <laughs> avec toi. <laughs> and we're both learning Arabic and we know about three words of Arabic between us. <laughs> um, salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, Ahlam wa sahlam. <laughs> and look, we stop this here. Next time we will practice a little bit more. But so we'll see if we have anyone, sorry, um, we'll see if we have anyone online. I think it looks like... Um, Do we have a few learners here? Oh, okay, we've got someone speaking Arabic. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Hi, Taha. Um, and uh, sorry about our sorry, very poor display with, with you, Arabic. You beautiful Arabic. Um, but you might, you might help us out here. Yes. <laughs> Um, can we encourage all of you to join us and please um, be interactive with us, send in your, your comments and we speak. We will maybe ask you some questions about your bilingualism and your experiences later. Someone is asking how does this work and um, the live questions, what we have on our screen is um, a, a feed uh, which gives us your questions. So if you have any questions during the course of the Hangout, um, you can type them and they will uh, pop up on our screen and we'll try and um, do um, keep an eye on the on the questions while we address the questions that you've some of you have posted um, on the on the question page um, in, in the in the actual course. And just for your own time time management we'll be here for 45 minutes so you can dip in and out um, as you wish and hopefully you have some time to join us. Um, what do you think? I think we can assume that people will be joining us um, as we've got. Um, Taha um, and Jani um, are here. Um, and as I expect Cham is Cham here is as well. And Jani. So um, nice to see you. Good. Um, but meanwhile, uh, we'll get started. Sorry, I'm wobbling the table. Um, meanwhile, we'll get started with um, just having a little bit of um, roundup about the first week. Although some of you, it's only Thursday, so some of you, but still finishing off um, and not have done um, the whole the whole of the first week. We understand that. Uh, but let's say that um, during the first week, we'll be we have been trying to um, put questions uh, out there, um, and this is um, something that you will see is consistently there. We um, we try not to give answers, and um, for some things, we believe that there's not one answer. Uh, but what, it, what we think is very important is to ask the questions, is to think about it, is to discuss it, is to reflect, is to um, go beyond assumptions uh, about language, multilingualism, monolingualism. So this was the first thing that we wanted to do. Um, and also questioning the fact that language is something which is 
quite neutral, something which, uh, you know, it's just the language. There's so much um, involvement in language at personal levels, but also at political levels, at social levels. Um, there's a lot, to, a lot more to language than just what comes out of our mouths when we try um, to communicate. Um, so the, the power investment in language is also something that we want to put out there for thinking. And uh, something that we've tried to do, and we'll touch this later on when addressing address some of the questions, um, is to, um, to question uh, also um, the idea of uh, monolingualism. Um, and this has been an issue for someone, but, uh, you know, um, whereas multilingualism, monolingualism, like, like a part, as part of languages, are not... Um, uh, devoid of assumptions, uh, which we'll be discussing a little bit um, later on. And uh, finally, we wanted to highlight the role of language and the importance of language beyond the instrumental. It's not just something that we use to communicate. It is, of course, something that we use to convey messages or do things with or try and, um, uh, and influence other people or uh, ask for things and so on. But it's not just this. There's a lot more involved in languages than just, um, than just what um, the, in, what in, what we make with it. There's involvement in emotional, in, in personal, in, in in social processes. So again, um, going back to asking questions and thinking about things, uh, which is the whole aim of this uh, of this course. Yes, and and to co to complement this, um, can we just say that we have a multiple of people from all over the world with us and with a multiple of languages. So greetings to you all. Greetings uh, to Evert from Belgium. Bonjour. Um, the bonjour Belgium. Marcella. Belgium. Oh no, Marcella is Colombian, Evert. no? <laughs> Buenos dias, Marcella. Marcella is here, um, Anjani is here, Taha. Um, Salam Aleikum. And Cham um, lives in Paris and speaks bonjour. Arabic and French <laughs> and English. Okay, so our multilingual experts are here, and in, on that note, why don't we start with um, the, our, our game? Um, so remember the uh, Welcome to Scotland film that you watched as one of the first steps in week one, and um, we are delighted that you responded so well to the film, and um, we must say it was an absolute pleasure to make the film and to invite people to reflect on their languages and to, to kind of show off the sounds and melodies of their languages. It was a pleasure for us to listen to these languages um, and we're delighted that it was also a pleasure for you and we very much enjoyed your comments and and we refer back to you know all the kind of questions and feelings about language and feeling at home and the emotions that are you know present in our languages we, we come back to all of that later but now um, we're going to give you the solution. So, <laughs> see how well you did. We had a look uh, before, and it's actually amazing how, you know, quite a few languages were recognized. Uh, but there are a few that were perhaps tricky. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And I mean, uh, we didn't expect anybody I to didn't. know, you know, all the languages. So don't, don't despair. Um, listen to them again <laughs> and, and try to match them again. It's, it's just fun to do that. Um, so Ugo um, spoke. <laughs> spoke. What did Ugo speak? <laughs> we don't have an answer well, for that, but I think we'll give the answer. Okay. Ugo sp uh, spoke Portuguese. Um, and obviously, all of um, our speakers spoke English because they, all of them, they lived in Glasgow in the United Kingdom. Um, Tina. Tina spoke Swahili. Yeah, and quite a few people identified yeah. Swahili, yeah. Very well done. And uh, Sam, um, Sam um, appeared twice and he spoke Finnish. He also spoke Russian. Ross? Italian. Italian, of Italiano, si. <laughs> and, and Pam spoke French. And somebody, um, somebody said Canadian French, which I'm actually not quite sure about, but I, I think she learned it in France. She learned it here in Europe, but maybe she has an accent, I'm not sure. Um, Olga. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> well, well done, done Evert. Evert was identified Portuguese. Well done. <laughs> Olga, 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 Olga. Olga spoke. No, not Spanish. Is Pam a native French speaker? No, no, Pam is Scottish. Eva, you're asking if Pam was a native French speaker. No, she just spoke. Um, she is Scottish and she learned French in, in high school. Um, and she obviously went, I think she actually went to Paris to learn it there. But she was um, very much a Francophile. She, she just fell in love with the language in school, she told us. Olga, back to Olga. Olga spoke not Spanish, but Galician. Yes. Um, Nick was a difficult one. I didn't know what Nick was speaking. Yes, Nick was actually from Brazil himself, but the language he decided to show us um, in the film was actually Esperanto. And Esperanto um, came up in your questions as well um, when we, you know, when you when you discussed amongst yourselves um, about the, the usefulness of one single language, and obviously Esperanto was one of these, you know. Mm -hmm. missions to, to, yes. to have a one, one single language. Mel. Mel lives in New Zealand and she spoke Maori, or she sang Maori to us. Um, Lily. Lily lives in Scotland um, and she spoke Gaelic or sang beautiful in Gaelic. Um, she, has, she has been a Gaelic singer almost all her life, she told us. Um, very beautiful, very beautiful voice. Um, Kim. Kim spoke <laughs> Danish. I didn't recognize it. Danish. I must admit. Yes, Danish. And Jill spoke Mandarin. <laughs> We're waiting to see if any of uh, the people that are online um, are trying to guess. Oh, yes, I've got Galician there. <laughs> uh, I think there's a little bit of delay, so people have to write, so I think we'll just carry on. Yeah, we just carry on. Ima, oh, sorry. Ima spoke Lithuanian. Hans spoke Greek. Gael, Polish, not German, Polish, but maybe sounds a bit similar. Faye spoke Hungarian. Ella spoke Ukrainian and Russian and was comfortable in, in both of them the same way she said. Don, Arabic. Um, Cora? Cora. Cora, I think. She spoke Greek as well as Hans did. Beth spoke Setswana. She came from Botswana. And Ava rounded off the whole film with a beautiful Romanian. Now, how many languages did you get right? <laughs> how many languages? How many I languages don't did know you get right? there was uh, not very many, I must confess. I think I got less than half, just gracefully enough. And I had a little bit of an advantage because I knew a couple uh, of people, so I knew what they would be speaking. So yes, all together, not really well. Um, moving on to uh, your the questions that you had um, and that you posted, um, Katya and I. There was a lot of languages that Marcella that Marcella had never heard. Mm -hmm. Um, uh -huh, I think that was the same for all of us. Or perhaps you hear them, but you don't know what they are, and you don't you don't recognize them. Um, I think that was the same for many of us. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know that any anyone actually managed to guess them all. Um, and that's the beauty. There are so many and um, such a great variety. Um, so I was saying, uh, Katya and I tried to spend some time um, organizing your questions and sort of kind of grouping them so that we could uh, address as many as possible uh, in the time that we have available. Uh, so I think uh, I will start off um, by 
uh, sort of um, as, as a way of introduction to, to the whole idea um, about a consideration on the questions that we received and how important these things are for people, mm -hmm. uh, how important language is for people, how much people care about language, how much people uh, think about language and, and, and feel with language. Um, and it is, a, 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 it seems to be a part of being a human being, uh, wanting to think about language and in a way having ideas about what language should be, what language should do, what we should do about languages. So the whole idea of wanting to regulate language or even wanted not to regulate language, which is another way of regulating language. So whether you know you think that it's important to preserve a language because it's part of uh, in, in or in parallel with biodiversity, as um, Alison um, very very interestingly um, sort of the draw this parallel. Uh, and there is a lot of, of people uh, who think that it is important to maintain the diversity of languages and if languages are in danger um, of extinction that we should do something to, to try, try and bring them back and this is being done for many languages that were minori minoritized um, over the world um, because of colonialism, colon colonialism um, and um, uh, and and uh, yes, and the need to to do something to bring them back. There are other people that think that um, it is essential not to touch languages. That languages are like a, a living organism, and all that we can do is observe what happens and the social um, the social interaction uh, will sort of decide which languages stay because they have a purpose a purpose which languages disappear because they don't serve a purpose anymore which languages modify uh, because they uh, they get in touch and mixed etc and this is another way of uh, not regulating languages by um, by sorry of regulating languages by not regulating them just standing back and observing them there are other people that think that we should um, okay have different languages but all speak a common language when we live in the same territory and this is the the, the attitude of um, of many um, many governments and George was pointing out I think about the fact that in Germany, if you want access to um, to benefits, you have to demonstrate that you speak German, if I understood that correctly. Uh, and the same in England um, and, and the UK, actually. Um, if you want to bring your family over um, and if uh, spouses wanted to, to um, to um, to come over, they have to demonstrate now that they speak English. So this is another way of regulating a language. And uh, so it seems that there's a lot in there that you know that languages are um, something. Yes, that something that they're very very important to people and. Um, also have a political dimension um, uh, type to them. They're not this neutral thing that comes out of our mouths and we do things with them, but have an important political dimension, a moral dimension. Who um, someone also mentioned um, mentioned this. David. Um, it was David. It was David yes. Yeah. Um, so all these things come into language. It's not just something that we say. It's a lot more to it. Yes. Um, and yeah, um, and just maybe maybe we could kind of touch on some of the the examples you you gave as well. Um, you know, a, a concrete example where maybe language becomes an excuse to you know regulate people or regulate people's bodies or you know categorize difference um, and all these sort of things. Um, so Alison, for example, she, she said, well, what is better? Is it better to think about language as a tool, as capital, or as biodiversity? And, and as Giovanna just said, it, and it really depends where you stand and where you position yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and if we think about, um, for example, well, we live in Scotland, we're here in the UK, 
you know, our educational institutions and Giovanna and I, we work here at the University of Glasgow, um, the way our world of work is regulated, it's regulated in a way that we need to speak English. We need, as academics, we need to publish in English in order to have a career. Um, if you are in a high school here in Scotland, then um, English is the language of, you know, learning and communication in the classroom, and um, and not just any English, mm -hmm. but a, a certain English, so a middle class English, um, and uh, all the other language practices, be it a working class uh, inflected English, be it any other languages than English is judged against the middle class English that is the status quo of our educational systems. So, um, so it becomes a way to regulate people and a way to, to, yeah, to, to regulate the difference that we find, um, we find in these environments. Um, so yes, language becomes, um, you know, becomes a, a capital, a social capital. Um, it becomes a way of, you know, pushing your career and 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 making a good life for yourself in the world. And those are all legitimate ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, but who decides? Yeah. And I think this is this is one dimension of language. And we've got questions coming up, so I'm trying to keep an eye on that as well. Mm -hmm. But um, this is one dimension. I mean, the language is a tool. Uh, and language is can be social capital, but that is one dimension of language, and it's certainly not the only dimension. Um, however, we are pushed to um, to standardise our language, um, to use particular languages by the way that things are set up. As Katia was saying, for example, in academia, um, if we want to publish, um, it's going to be a lot more. Uh, useful for careers to publish in English than it is in other languages, for example. But even here, uh, we are speaking English. Um, Future Learn has a policy of uh, not allowing people to to use other languages in their comments, for example, because uh, it would be impossible to to check what's being said, and uh, people could use it for uh, for different purposes. So we have constraints that are. Um, not depending on us, uh, but depending on how, the way that the world is structured. Uh, and for some ways, it is structured for monolinguals, as we, um, so that was one of the questions that we posed at the beginning. But it's also um, recognizing, and again, to just bring, um, um, to, to, to talk about a little bit more about what Katia was saying, it's also recognizing the social uh, dimension of languages uh, and and how very often languages uh, um, and what languages are valued both as a variety of a particular language or as uh, the, the languages that we learn in our schools um, um, have a, um, a social dimension in that there are usually the attitudes, the languages, the, 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 the experiences with languages that belong to a particular uh, social class. Uh, and usually this is the, the middle class, the people who uh, have, whose parents take them on holiday, who have books in other languages mm -hmm. in the house, or see the parents appreciating other languages, or go to see films in other, in other languages, and so on. And this attitude is an attitude that comes easier to some groups than to other groups. And that was part of the point that mm -hmm. um, David Grambling was making about a certain attitude towards uh, monolingual monolinguals, which is a little bit um, a way of saying, "Oh dear, these people do not appreciate languages and uh, do not appreciate, you know, do not want to learn other languages." Which is true, but sometimes this is not a choice. But it is the fact that you've not been exposed, that you've not been made to appreciate, that you don't see the value. And it goes with education and it goes with social class. So we need to be very careful about this and reflect about this. Which is not to say that speaking many languages is not good. It's not to say that, that we don't appreciate uh, 
uh, multilingualism we all do and we think it's a brilliant thing and everybody should uh, speak more than one language but to recognize these dynamics I suppose we were, we were discussing this earlier a little bit and and um, I think kind of coming like marrying this with your comments as well that um, when we speak about language and advocating for multilingualism that you know it's not just we're not just advocating for um, certain a certain linguistic construct um, we're also recognizing that you know advocating for people to have access to these wonderful resources and ways of looking at the world that has to come with it so our love of multilingualism has to come with the willingness and the commitment to advocate for let's say more just educational institutions and for people to get access to learning multiple languages um, yes. and, and being able to see the world in different ways. If those two things don't come together, then our, you know, our love of multilingualism and our hope and our, ad, you know, being so adamant about multilingualism is can also then otherwise become a way to exclude people. Yes. Um, because you know, we just have, oh, and monolinguals are lost. Honestly. Can I just sorry um, say that as you were speaking, yeah. I saw the Everett um, their uh, recognized body in my yes. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, um, uh, can I come clean that I'm a big. Um, Baudier fan and it probably that came through my <laughs> little speech. I was uh, Pierre Baudier being um, a, a, a social theorist that um, um, uh, yes I, I've, I'm quite fond and obviously it came through there. Yeah absolutely and, and maybe maybe to, to stick with Baudier as well that um, I think what we're saying is so so we just said now we can't we never can look at language as kind of separated from social experience, from cultural experience, it, it, it belongs to that, it's interwoven with these things. And then also it's interwoven in our bodies. Um, and I think Bourdieu has this lovely expression habitus. So the way we move through the world um, and through encounters with our environments and, and encounters with people, our bodies are practiced in certain ways to do certain things. So the habitus, so our languages and our cultures also sit in our bodies mm -hmm. um, by the way we're doing things. And maybe in a kind of stereotypical way, this would be the way I as a German mm -hmm. greet Giovanna by shaking her hand. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so 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 social, cultural and bodily aspects, this is not to be separated from our language yes. as a linguistic. And um, someone ha did bring up uh, the sort of the, the personal and intimate dimension of, of languages which is definitely something else which is there so languages are uh, this extraordinary complex um, um, to, um, ensemble of uh, the personal the social the instrumental um, that oh, you know that, that, and that all comes together in this entity which is language and um, Katya and I was talk were talking before we started um, um, the hangout um, last night I uh, went to a poetry reading in which people read in their own language um, uh, a poem and then read it uh, the translation of it and there was someone that the Katya and I both know there and I was really um, um, it was really interesting to see how this person physically changed when she was reading the same poem in English and then uh, and then in uh, in her uh, in her own language which is Greek she the, her body changed and her voice change she had a different voice when she was reading it in Greek um, and she did um, look more um, at home mm -hmm. in her own language or maybe that is my assumption but that as I think that was probably the case and this goes really well um, Giovanna with Taha's comment here um, and so Taha says um, ah you this is gone when is it gone uh, um, so it, the question was about if body language is part of our language. Um, so after we it's disappeared. Well, I think I think more or less. Sorry if we put it your question, but um, is, is the body language then part of our language? 
And I would say, yes, it is, after what John just described. And there is this, there is this new term um, in, um, in language studies, and it's called translingualism. And, and the idea of translingualism, as opposed to multilingualism, recognizes that we draw on many semiotic resources in our communication. So we draw on language, we draw on body language, we draw on visuals, we draw on many things. So under this umbrella translingualism, definitely body language is part of our language, yes. Um, and from, from the way you wrote about language, from the way Giovanna just spoke about language and I spoke about language, we, we, when we think about language as more as a way of being in the world and of, being, of communicating in the world. So yes, of course, it, is, it involves our bodies. And talking about bodies, can I just ask um, maybe Anjani or Taha who seem to be there, can you see us? Because I've had just a, um, a sort of a awful. Uh -huh. But maybe. Can you okay. see? Could, can you let us know if you can see us? Um, just in case. We carry on, but um, yeah, hopefully you're not just hearing us. You should be able to see us as well, but I'm not 100%. There's a little box here that says you, and I can't see anything. But okay, let's just carry on. And it, it, otherwise, it'll be a radio broadcast instead of yes, a video if, broadcast. If so, we apologize. But, but <laughs> let, please let us know if you can actually see us. Mm. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a doubt because there's a black window that says you there. Okay, we're not okay. touching anything. It's no. going to be <laughs> so, um, so, yes. Um, Something else which um, uh, quite a few questions uh, refer to um, was bilingualism. Um, and that um, was, um, there were very, a, a big range of questions uh, around bilingualism. One was, um, I think Aitor and Martin asked, um, when can we consider bilingual? And some someone someone replied, you know, I, I feel, or someone, I can't remember who it was, but said, I feel that I'm not bilingual because I'm not uh, like a native speaker. And there is uh, uh, this idea that you need, that being bilingual is being double monolingual. Yes. And the two things are not the same. Um, being bilingual is not uh, um, being equally fluent in both languages. Being bilingual is... <laughs> you gave me this example earlier. <laughs> yes, that's what I think it's, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but being bilingual is not, um, you know, having both wheels exactly the same size. It's more like your old time um, bicycles, the ones that had a little wheel and a bigger wheel. Um, and you are bilingual when you can get uh, what you want to do with your language, when you can do what you want to do with a language. Uh, and it might be that that depends on your life circumstances. <laughs> so this is bilingualism. <laughs> um, so, and that, um, and that will change with your life circumstances. It will depend on what, you know, of course, if you are a radio broadcaster, uh, and if I were a radio broadcaster in Germany, I would need a different level of German than if I was, for example, to, to be a, a seamstress in, 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 in Germany. Uh, but when you can do with your language what you need to do to, to get by every day, then I think you can be considered bilingual. Um, and there's also the fact that proficiency will change and uh, will change over time and again it will change over circumstances. If from, from, from being a seamstress I then stand for candidacy and I become an MP, I will need to, uh, my, my language will probably need to increase uh, um, um, just to do um, uh, um, um, an a wild example. Uh, so it will be floating and it will be changing over time. I have a good example of mm -hmm. that. Um, for example, um, uh, let's say two years ago, I was really scared doing phone calls in English. 
and I don't know if you have the same experience, but it was something about not having the person in front of me and you know drawing on on body language and all sorts of things. So I got really nervous if I had to call, especially like gas companies to to renew contracts or anything like that. Um, and I'm okay now. That has changed. Like my my competency doing phone calls in English has improved definitely. Um, we were last week. We were asked to give a presentation to a group of German politicians. And, and we had an interpreter, but because um, uh, my mother tongue is German, I was asked to do my presentation in German. Now, I had never done this work presentation in German, always in English. So doing it in German, I was all over the place. I couldn't, I didn't have the kind of professional work terms in German and was really struggling, um, although German is my mother tongue. But my proficiency in work, in work-related terms and language, my English proficiency is better than in German. Um, and, and relating to this, people were asking questions about identity. What happens to your identity when you're bilingual? And my uh, reply to this would be exactly the same. It will change. You have um, you have a you have an identity in both languages. I you've got a, an identity that spans both languages as a speaker of more than two or two or more languages and also this will change over time and there are times when I feel more Italian and less British or I feel more at home in Italian than I do in English and other times when it's the opposite depending on what I need to do. My own children are bilingual um, not a bicycle bilingual, but a monos but, but the whatever the other one is the, called the, um, uh, that one bilingual, yeah. Um, but uh, for example, my um, my uh, my eldest daughter is planning now to to study something in Italy, and I've no doubt that if that goes through, because goes through very soon, her um, you know her Italian and her Italian identity with it would probably be. Um, greater and bigger than it's at the moment so it's all uh, quite fluctuating but what is important is that being bilingual is a good thing and that children um, um, as Laura problem um, was a bit concerned about that you could have so kind of overload children with languages but if children grow up organically in an environment where more than one language or two or even three languages are spoken they acquire them uh, with no problem. I mean, this is research is quite happily now demonstrated this to be the case that the issue and the fear of interference between languages is is not uh, is not the case. Which doesn't mean that children would not mix the languages. Well, they will. This is called translanguaging, and it's perfectly part of being um, of being uh, bilingual or, or, or plurilingual the fact that you can actually switch between uh, different languages um, um, it's it's all part and parcel and it's a skill in its own which is very important so I mean I would encourage anyone to um, out there um, to to teach the um, children um, or to expose children to several languages and Claire and Amelia, I think, pointed out the benefits of um, of speaking more than one language, which, um, as just to reiterate, um, research has now been demonstrating consistently for a num numbers of years. So, yes. yeah. And please, um, please send us your bilingual experiences. If you have grown up bilingually, if your mum, your dad, um, is you know has raised you in a bilingual way, send. Tell us your experience, um, and um, because um, Emma, Emma was asking um, everybody really in the in the future community how has bilingualism impacted your identity. So so please send us your your comments. Um, uh, um, can I just? There was someone before. I think uh, it was um, Kasia, uh, um, one of our team, that said yeah, that yeah. there's a, a, a tweet. Mm -hmm. um, that came in asking about how it is possible to expose to multilingualism uh, in schools. Um, and uh, there was also another question relating to schools and education that came from Lucy. Um, so um, I'm, I'm happy to reply to Lucy and do you want to, mm -hmm. to take this one? Um, Lucy um, was saying, um, does the the okay for those of you who are not in Scotland, 
Um, Scotland encourages the teaching of um, two uh, foreign languages um, in, uh, in education, in, in compulsory education. Um, so the model is called one plus two, so the mother tongue uh, English, uh, the, no, the mother tongue plus two other languages. Um, and whether that might encourage um, children to become more confident, and, and I can only be in favour of teaching children um, languages in school. The more, the better, and the wider the range, I, I am convinced, the better as well. Uh, it is important not to limit um, exposure just to French, German, Italian and Spanish, and now also Chinese, but to widen the range of languages that are taught. However, equally important, and this is where I feel that education, not just in Scotland, uh, in England as well, perhaps in England um, even more so, does not give anywhere near enough time to, um, to languages. Um, again, there are studies that, that demonstrate that to achieve competence in a language, you, you, you need quite a, a substantial amount of time. Um, we know that uh, Gaelic, for example, um, is taught in uh, Gaelic medium schools, or at least there are subjects that are, told, uh, that are taught in Gaelic. We know that you can achieve proficiency in a language, uh, and a degree of proficiency that lets you uh, really do things with the language and use it, uh, but it has to be quite a substantial, a little, certainly more than an hour uh, or a couple of hours a week, which is um, is not um, is not enough. And um, as far as I'm aware, um, in in Scotland there is no time allocation in, in the curriculum. Uh, there are indications, but not time allocation. So um, it's never enough. Uh, it's not enough. Um, we de definitely need a little bit more. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's our first comment coming in about a bilingual um, experience. So this is um, Lily. 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 Lily writes, my son is three. He is bilingual. We only use Arabic at home all the time. He started going to nursery a few months ago. And since then, he started speaking in English only. He seems to learn English very quickly. And he loves using it more than Arabic. Don't worry about it. Now, this is a mother of uh, bilingual children. Um, I, I never pushed my children to, um, to use Italian with me. I didn't want to make it an issue. I didn't want to make it something that became a bone of contention and, and that might spoil their pleasure of learning and, and, and for speaking the language. So uh, my own children, which is, Totally fair. When they speak to me, they speak English. Um, when they speak to their father, they speak English. Uh, I speak to them in Italian. They reply in English, which amused quite a few people that, that hear us. Um, but when they speak to their grandmother, their Italian comes out. When we go to Italy and they go to their aunt or their cousins, their Italian comes out. It's not perfect, as I was saying before. It doesn't matter. It's perfectly fine for what they need to do with it. And it's perfectly fine to build on, uh, should they want to build on in the future. Um, and um, yeah, and what is important is to, is to keep it. Um, I also know people who did not keep their language, they didn't think that the language was important enough to, to keep speaking it to their children, and they have cut off these children from their grandparents, which is, I think is terribly sad, because they, they, now these children can't communicate with their grandparents because they don't speak the same language. Um, but the pressure of English, you've got these children then come home speaking English to you, uh, and the pre the, it's easy to, to, to slip into that, but not to do it. And that's uh, <laughs> my word of advice, and I'm pretty convinced of that. Yes, and you know, I'm thinking of the, the Welcome uh, to Scotland films, where the, the short documentary you watched, and I remember Ugo um, saying the same thing, that he, he sees Portuguese very much as an affectionate language, like you said about Italian. Mm -hmm. it, he wants it to be an affectionate language rather than an imposition or anything mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and maybe that link 
Is it the kind of wish that, that your children associate Italian with something affectionate and a family language? Yes. Rather than and also, yes, yeah. and also it is a great gift to give children yeah. to um, to have a language for free, really, without having to and. Um, learn, knowing two languages means that you are then, um, and again, there's plenty of studies that demonstrate this. I don't think there's any doubt in the academic um, world that knowing another language just make makes it a lot more easier for people to learn than another one. And the more you know, the more um, you understand how languages work, and uh, and that a language is just that. Um, um, and that different languages are structured in different ways and therefore you're more elastic to learn other languages. But there was a question, and now I forget who it was. Um, how can we expose... How about how do we can expose uh, children to multilingualism in schools? Yes. Um, and so that came via Twitter, I think. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. So, and and I, will, I will answer it from a slightly different viewpoint because we talked a lot about now the sort of you know, um, sanction, well, the, the kind of normal languages you learn in school, like German, French, and so on. I will, I will answer it from the perspective of, um, of, um, of uh, a non-dominant languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as part of our work in Glasgow, um, we work in a further education college um, with um, ESOL teachers in a, in a course that caters um, mostly for um, refugee minors. So there would be um, teenagers who are between 16 and 21 years old um, who live um, here in Glasgow, have been dispersed to Glasgow um, and, and live mostly um, without, without guardians. Um, and they um, attend an ESOL course in Glasgow, um, which is very much um, geared towards their own languages. Now, an ESOL, it's an ESOL course, so they, they, are, they are, of course, learning English. Um, but So imagine a classroom of 20 students from all over the world, um, and within this classroom of 20 people, you have 17 different languages. So 17 diverse languages, ranging from Tigrinya, Amharic, Kinder, Borgo, Arabic, um, Vietnamese, uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, um, and so on. Um, so already you have a presence of, a huge presence of languages in just one classroom. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that these languages are really present in the education environment because of course, you know, in the name of integration and all that kind of thing, we, we make these, um, these students learn English and, and often they're like, <clears throat> they, the students are in a deficit position where they are sort of in light of the requirements to learn English very quickly and, you know, the middle class English we were talking about, um, they're actually having a deficit. They lack language if seen from the perspective of the middle class English requirements. Now, the like a simple answer would be well in some way we sort of have to try to reverse or at least rupture that sort of deficit model where these students with these amazing language resources they bring to the classroom um where we sort of position them in a in a, in a position of plenty of plenty languages they have plenty languages it's not their lack of languages they already have a lot of languages so i suppose the first step would be to acknowledge the presence of plenty the presence of these plenty languages in the classroom and then the next que question is well how can we harness how can we harness these amazing resources how can we harness all the you know the cultural capital that comes with that the the skills and the kind of forms of embodiment that come with all of these languages mm. and um I just give you this example from this ESOL course here in glasgow um is that um and is, is our last point really um that the, the way those teachers do it is they actually engage with the students in activities which sometimes don't write, are not language, geared towards language acquisition at all. So they do a lot of art making, they, they do drama activities, they do outdoor learning activities, because all these are environments in which communication is required, but a language is not imposed. So people, you know, they do things together practically, 
And then at the same time, they're learning each other's languages. They're also learning English at the same time, but they're also exchanging, you know, their own languages because the educators are making space for all the languages to be used in communication. So sometimes almost a shift away from English language competence and English language acquisition onto a more practical activity creates a space where all the other languages can come out. But um, and I think um, uh, that if I remember it correctly, it's next week that there is something specifically on this and a couple mm -hmm. of uh, examples of way in which um, uh, different languages have been used in classrooms um, um, uh, drawing on what the, the the children or the young people bring with them so the various classes and of course if this is um, not uh, depending on where you where you're teaching and this might not be the case it must it might be more difficult if you if you're teaching in a small school in a remote area where more or less all the children mm -hmm. speak speak exactly the same language um, speak the same language so in that case you might have to be thinking um, um, a little bit more um, um, constructively about um, uh, bringing in um, whether there is anyone else in the community, for example, that speaks a different language, uh, using um, video and audio uh, and the internet as, as resources and so on. Uh, but if you do have children that speak a variety of language in the classroom, then you have the perfect mm -hmm. um, um, which is not to say that you will be teaching all the languages, but it's that you will be teaching appreciation, enjoyment, and fun. Making a place for yes, yeah. and making a place for the languages. But we will be back going back to this and to most of these topics again in next week when we'll be talking about um, some of these things a little bit more, more in detail. Meanwhile, I think we're at the end mm -hmm. of our um, Google Hangout for the day. Um, and um, I hope you're enjoying our course. We're definitely enjoying reading all your comments. They are all brilliant, and um, we're getting already to know some of you. Um, it kind of feels uh, personally, so um, a personal relationship, so uh, we can, you know, um, exchange. We say, okay, yeah, I've, I've seen this comment uh, by this by this um, learner and uh, made a beautiful comment and so on. So we're really engaging with it. Um, believe us, we're um, really enjoying every minute of it. So, vielen Dank, dass ihr ähm, mitgemacht habt bei unserem Hangout und ähm, danke, dass ihr in unserem Kurs so fleißig mitarbeitet und äh, hoffentlich sehen wir euch nächste Woche bei unserem zweiten Hangout wieder. And I'm, I'm not sure she'll be doing this in Italian or Friuliano. I'm going to say arrivederci, grazie per essere stati con noi e ci vediamo la prossima settimana. Ciao, ciao. Masalama. <laughs> Masalama. <laughs>